Today we will learn and reflect on Pericles, the great leader of the radical democracy of ancient Athens, where the citizens voted directly on all political decisions and the start of the Peloponnesian Wars. Why do we want to study the Peloponnesian Wars? Simple. You cannot understand Greek philosophy and history without studying these wars. We did not want to cut any more videos on the Platonic Dialogues until we studied the Peloponnesian Wars. And this is the first set of videos where we examine both the history and Plutarch's moral biographies of the key Athenian leaders before and in the first years of the war. Socrates lived through and fought in these wars and was tried and executed after these wars. Many dialogues respond to the issues and questions raised by these wars. And these four succeeding videos also examine both the history and Plutarch's moral biographies of the key Athenian and Spartan leaders during and at the end of this first great war of history. The brilliant and outrageous war leader of both Athens and Sparta, Alcibiades, is a leading character in the famous Platonic dialogue, the Symposium, where Alcibiades characteristically crashes a dinner party attended by Socrates. Alcibiades was both a friend and a student of Socrates, and indeed, in the Battle of Potidaea, early in the Peloponnesian Wars, Socrates saved Alcibiades on the battlefield. Alcibiades is given a Platonic dialogue of his own, although modern scholars debate on whether this dialogue is genuine, it was highly regarded in the ancient world as an excellent introduction to Platonic philosophy. Another one of Socrates' students was Critias, a violent leader of the Thirty Tyrants who were placed in power in Athens after she was defeated by Sparta at the end of these great wars. After the radical democracy overthrew these tyrants, these suspect friendships made the Athenians suspicious of Socrates, especially since he was known to criticize the democracy. Indeed, these suspicions were a contributing factor in his trial for impiety and his subsequent execution events memorialized in their own Platonic Dialogues. And the preeminent Platonic Dialogue, the Republic, seems to be conflicted as to whether the Spartan or Athenian form of government and culture is superior. Finally, to the Greeks, this was a war like no other war, involving nearly all of the Greek city-states in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, and also Persia, similar to the two great wars of modern times, the two world wars. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video, Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint script posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Herodotus wrote the history of the Greco-Persian War while Thucydides started chronicling the Peloponnesian Wars. In his introduction, Thucydides writes, Thucydides, an Athenian, wrote the history of the war between the Peloponnesians, also known as the Spartans, and the Athenians, beginning at the moment that it broke out, and believing that it would be a great war and more worthy of revelation than any that had preceded it. Now, Herodotus had more piety by ancient standards. He included many references to the gods and how they influenced history in the distant past. Thucydides rarely mentions the gods, although he does discuss omens and oracles. He seeks political explanations and natural causes for his histories. Many scholars regard him as the first modern historian. Thucydides was born several decades after Herodotus. They were contemporaries, although it's unlikely they ever met. Although Thucydides lived through the entire Peloponnesian War, he died before completing his history, stopping in mid-chapter and mid-sentence. His history was resumed from that point by the Greek writer and historian Xenophon. Both were generals, but Athens exiled Thucydides after he was unsuccessful in preventing Amphipolis with its silver mines from being captured. J.B. Burry, in his book on Greek historians, observes, In his introduction, Thucydides sets a new standard of truth or accurate reproduction of facts and a new ideal of historical research, judged by which he finds Herodotus wanting and he condemns Herodotus expressly for aiming and providing a good reading rather than facts, and for narrating the stories the truth of which cannot possibly be tested. He does not seek himself to furnish entertainment or to win popular success, but to construct a record which shall be permanently valuable because it is true. 
Thucydides warns his readers that they will find nothing mythical in his works. And J.B. Burry continues, While Herodotus was influenced by the epic, the artistic method of Thucydides must rather be compared with that of the drama. Thucydides adheres as closely to his argument as a tragic poet, and he replaces the omniscient chorus with speeches by major characters, which are based on the memories of what was actually said, supplemented by what should have been said. Professor Burry continues, Thucydides' first consideration was accuracy. He had to follow events and not mold them into correspondence with an artistic plan. And his strict chronological order excluded devices of arrangement, but occasionally we can detect deliberate management. Another major source is Plutarch and his life of Pericles, the great Athenian general and leader, included in his works Pairing Noble Greek and Roman Lives, written about 450 years after these wars. Plutarch says he paired the lives of Pericles and Fabius Maximus, and that's the Roman general who fought so relentlessly against Hannibal, because the most important traits they shared were self-possession and integrity and their ability to endure the foolishness of the populace and their colleagues, and this made them particularly valuable to their countries. Plutarch gives us a reason why we should study the actions of virtuous men. Actions arising out of virtue puts us in a frame of mind where we simultaneously admire the acts and desire to emulate the agents, great men of history. We appreciate the good things that come to us by chance, but we appreciate more doing the good deeds which come to us from virtue. Moreover, while we want to receive the former from others, we want others to receive the latter from us. Noble histories instill in us an immediate urge to action. It does not build moral character in the spectator merely by means of a story, but by giving him purpose through an account of the deed. In other words, the study of history should improve our moral character. Plutarch's major source is Thucydides. Most of his other sources are now lost in the sands of history, likely in part due to the excellence of his writings. Our third major source is The Life of Greece by the modern historian Will Durant who also uses Thucydides and Plutarch as his major sources. The story of the Greco-Persian Wars is a simple story. Victory in three key battles won the wars for the Greeks. But like our modern world wars, the Peloponnesian War is a very difficult story to tell, spanning many years, many battles, many participants, many temporary truces, many theaters of war. The reach of the Peloponnesian Wars was broad. It spanned the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. The conflicts that sparked the war between Athens and the Spartan ally Corinth were over two Corinthian colonies, Epidamnus on the west coast of Greece and Potidae on the east coast. There were also struggles over Amphipolis, an Athenian possession near Thrace in the north, where the silver mines that helped Athens finance the war were located. The Athenians liberated the Greek city-states on the coast of Asia Minor and wrested control of Byzantium, modern-day Istanbul, which controlled access to the grain that helped feed the Athenians. Plus, there was a major battle in Sicily off the boot of Italy and military actions in Cyprus. These wars involved most of the city-states of the Greek world, in addition to Persia. Thucydides says that the Peloponnesian Wars began about 50 years after the Greco-Persian Wars, ending when King Xerxes and his army fled mainland Greece for the safety of Persia. However, Dr. Wikipedia and many scholars include the Athenian military campaigns against the Persians in the 20 years after the flight of Xerxes as part of that earlier war. And the Peloponnesian Wars set the stage for Alexander the Great's absorption of Greece 60 years afterwards. The Spartan king Archidamus warned his fellow Spartans about going to war with Athens. In the course of my life, I've taken part in many wars, and I see among you people of the same age as I am. They and I have had experience, and so are not as likely to share in what may be a great general enthusiasm for war, nor to think that war is a good thing or a safe thing. If you look carefully, this war will not be likely anything on a small scale. War with Athens will be different. Athens is a sea power. Sparta is a land power. King Archidamus continues, We must not bolster ourselves up with the false hope that if we devastate their land, the war will soon be over. I fear that it is more likely that we shall be leaving this war to our children after us. And like the modern great world wars one and two, the Peloponnesian Wars did indeed span generations. 
Ironically, although the Spartan king Archidamus was opposed to the war, when war was declared, he brought the war to Athens. In this first phase of the Peloponnesian Wars is named by historians as the Archidamian War. So what was the prelude to the Peloponnesian Wars? Historians might mislead you into thinking that wars have a definite beginning and a definite end. Often the real history is muddier. There are constant conflicts and battles, and many wars in the decades between these two great wars. Summarizing the Greek victory in the Greco-Persian Wars, Athens was the savior of Greece in these wars. First, the Persian King Darius raided Greece with a small army and navy, thinking he could easily defeat the Greeks. However, the Athenian hoplites surprised and charged the Persian forces in the Battle of Marathon, totally decimating the Persian infantry and even capturing seven Persian ships. The remaining ships fled with King Darius back to Persia. Many years later, his son, King Xerxes, returned with a much larger force, marching and sailing down the Greek coast. A small band of Spartans held back the entire Persian army for many days at the Battle of the Pass of Thermopylae, fighting to their deaths. Athens once again came to the rescue of Greece when she defeated the Persian navy in the Battle of the Straits of Salamis, forcing the Persian navy to return to Persia. The core of the Persian army that was left behind was defeated by a combined Greek army in the following year in the Battle of Plataea. Thucydides records these events by bridging the end of the Greco-Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars in a chapter called the Penacontatia, or the 50-year period starting from the year the Persians leave mainland Greece. Soon after the Persians were forced out of mainland Greece, the Athenian general Chimot, and in Greek C is pronounced as K, scored a major victory against the Persians. The Persians, fearful of the naval prowess of the Athenians, beached their triremes and constructed what they thought was a secure camp. The Greeks under Chimon destroyed both the Persian fleet and the camp, slaughtering the rowers and soldiers. The booty was so vast that the Athenians coined special silver coins commemorating the defeat, and a peace was signed with Persia, where Persia recognized the independent status of the Greek city-states on the western coast of Asia Minor. At the end of the Persian Wars, Athens decided to build a city wall not only around the city of Athens, but also the four-mile-long walls from Athens to their two port cities at the Piraeus and Phalerum. Sparta was concerned that Athens was building these fortifications, so they sent a delegation to Athens to inquire. In response, the Greek leader Themistocles traveled to Sparta, supposedly waiting for his delayed fellow delegates until he received words that the walls were tall enough to be defensible. He then announced to the Spartans that the Athenians would continue to build their walls and that any city was right to defend its own self-interest. And Professor Harl of the Teaching Company argues that this incident began the discontent that Sparta felt towards Athens that eventually led to the war. Now we'll discuss the formation of the Delian League. During the Greco-Persian Wars, the Spartans were the leaders of the Greek world. But when the arrogant Spartan king and commander Pausanias tried to bully many of the Greek city-states, particularly those on the coast of Asia Minor, they grew irritated with Pausanias and pleaded with Aristides the Just of Athens to instead form the Delian League. At first, the larger allies were asked to provide ships, but many allied states, particularly the smaller states, preferred a cash tribute. For many years, the tribute money was deposited into the league treasury on the island of Delos. But as the league gradually morphed into an Athenian empire, Pericles transferred these monies into the treasury of Athens to help pay for the building program at Athens, earning the resentment of many of her lives. And part of the justification was that the Persians had burned the major buildings of Athens when she occupied it in the Greco-Persian Wars. Kenneth Harrell, in his eighth lecture on the Peloponnesian War, describes the politics of the Delian League. Now, indeed, the Ionian Greek city-states convinced Aristides the Just of Athens to form the Delian League. The Greek city-states consented to a level of tribute that was a little bit more than what the tribute they had paid to the Persians. The Delian League had an assembly that met on the island of Delos. Each state had a vote, but Athens was able to dominate this assembly from the first because many of the smaller states were afraid to cross Athens from the very beginning. Athens, at the end of the Greco-Persian Wars, was somewhat in the same position that the United States was in after World War II, when all the other powers had been devastated, but America was transcendent because she ruled the seas. Well, Durant says that in his history, 
Athens dominated this period because she had won the allegiance and contributions of most Aegean cities by her leadership in saving Greece. And because when the war was over, Ionia was impoverished and Sparta was disordered by demobilization, earthquake, and insurrection. Well, Durant tells us, Themistocles set the course of Greek history by persuading Athens that the road to supremacy lay not on land but on sea, and not by war so much as by trade. He negotiated with Persia and sought to end the strife between the old and young empire so unimpeded commerce with Asia might bring prosperity to Athens. He knew that these policies would arouse the jealousy of Sparta and might lead to war between the rival states. But he was stirred on by his vision of Athens' development and his confidence in the Athenian fleet. Why did the allies of Athens revolt? Thucydides reasons that the chief reasons for these revolts were failures to produce the right amount of tribute or the right number of ships, and sometimes their refusal to produce any ships at all. For the Athenians were tough and brutal in enforcing payment of the tribute owed to the Delian League. Several delinquent city-states were put under siege, and when defeated, the men were executed and the women and children sold into slavery. And one of the first instances of this policy was when the Greek city-state of Naxos tried to leave the Delian League. The Athenian general Cimon put the city under siege, and then he tore down the city walls, forced the adoption of democracy, destroyed their navy, forcing them to pay tribute to the League. This set the precedent for how Athens would treat future rebellious city-states. Historians love this quotation from Thucydides. Thucydides continues, The Athenians as rulers were no longer as popular as they used to be. They bore more than their fair share of the actual fighting, but this made it all the easier for them to force back into the alliance any state that wanted to leave it. For this position, it was the allies themselves who were to blame. Thucydides continues, Because of this reluctance of theirs to face military service, most of them, to avoid serving abroad, had assessments made by which, instead of producing ships, they were to pay a corresponding sum of money, and the result was that the Athenian navy grew strong at their expense. When they revolted, they always found themselves inadequately armed and inexperienced at war. Thucydides reasons that in the period between the retreat of Xerxes and the beginning of this present war, the Athenians made their empire stronger and stronger. The Spartans, though they saw what was happening, did little or nothing to prevent it, being traditionally slow to go to war unless they were forced into it, and also prevented from taking action by wars in their own territory. Finally, the point was reached when Athenian strength reached and attained a peak, plain for all to see, and the Athenians began to encroach upon Sparta's allies. During the time between the Greco-Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars, a new upcoming politician named Pericles, who was also a successful general, came to dominate the political life of Athens. Although many Greeks were grateful to Themistocles for his leading the Greeks to victory against the Persians, he was known for taking bribes, and he was ostracized and died in exile. Pericles was born three years before Marathon into an aristocratic family who assisted in the democratic reforms and who fought at Salamis. Pericles studied under the philosopher Anaxagoras, who sought natural and scientific explanations for celestial phenomena. He thought that the universe was controlled by a central intelligence that he called nous, or reason. And this is a terminology that the Eastern Church Fathers will use quite often. And since man also possessed nous, that meant that man possessed a mark of the divine. For instance, quoting Diogenes, Anaxagoras held that the Milky Way is a reflection of the light of the stars that are not illuminated by the sun, and the comets are a conglomeration of planets that emit flames, and shooting stars are thrown off the air like sparks. Winds arise when the air is rarefied by the actions of the sun, and thunder is a collision of the clouds, lightening the violent friction of the clouds. Anaxagoras also speculated that the sun is a red-hot mass of iron and is larger than the Balabanes. And we know in the modern world, yeah, it's much, much larger. And for this speculation, he was tried in Athens for impiety, denying the agency of the gods. Pericles defended him, but he was exiled from Athens. Now what's amazing is that in Copleston's History of Philosophy, he devotes a whole chapter to Anaxagoras, and that's amazing because his writings survive only in fragments. Unlike most Greek men, Pericles married for love when he married the courtesan Aspasia. Will Duran tells us that when she arrived in Athens about 450 BC, 
Aspasia opened a school of rhetoric and philosophy and boldly encouraged the public emergence and higher education of women. Many girls of good families came to her classes, and some husbands brought their wives to study with her. Men also attended her lectures, including Pericles and Socrates and many others. Now when Pericles' wife suggested a divorce to marry another, Pericles agreed and brought Aspasia home. For her part, Aspasia made Pericles' home like a French Enlightenment salon, where art and science, literature, philosophy, and statesmanship of Athens were brought together in mutual stimulation. Socrates marveled at her eloquence and credited her with composing the funeral oration that Pericles delivered after the first casualties of the Peloponnesian War. Aspasia became the uncrowned queen of Athens, setting fashion's tone and giving to women of the city an exciting example of mental and moral freedom. Professor Jeremy McInerney argues that Aspasia may have been more like a geisha, a woman of culture, rather than a courtesan. He cites recently discovered funerary inscriptions that suggest that she may have been from an aristocratic family. Since she was foreign born, she had the status of a concubine since she could not legally marry Pericles. And these accusations that she was a courtesan may simply be invective from the comic poets and political enemies of Pericles. And Professor Jeremy McInerney of the Teaching Company reminds us that one consequence of the ostracism of the conservative aristocrat Timon was that Ephialtes with Pericles pushed through the reforms leading to the radical democracy, taking away many judicial powers from the Council of the Areopagus and strengthening the role of the ordinary Athenian in the law courts, the juries, and other offices. Aristocrats now had very few political privileges not enjoyed by the middle class of trireme rowers and ordinary citizens, furthering the democratic and judicial reforms begun many years earlier in Athens. And after Ephialtes was assassinated under suspicious circumstances, Pericles was thrust into the limelight in his early 30s. Will Duran tells us that Pericles introduced modest fees for jury service as well as military service and even had a modest pay for Athenians who attended the official festivals and assembly. Many conservatives like Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch agree that these pittances injured the Athenian character, which is rather doubtful in my opinion. Pericles also embarked on public works projects at a scale not seen before. There was a massive building program on the Acropolis. The architect Phidias replaced the temples burnt and destroyed by the Persians with the Parthenon with a grand statue of Athena and other new temples. The Athenians also built the long walls to the Piraeus and Phalerum, ports of Athens. Triremes were added to the fleet. Plutarch relates that the enemy of Pericles said that the Greeks regarded it as an outrageously arrogant treatment, as blatant tyranny, when the Greek city-states can see that we are using the funds they were forced to contribute for the military defense of Greece to build and embellish Athens, as if she were a vain woman adorning herself with costly marble, statues, and temples at a thousand talents at a time. In response, Pericles told the Athenian people that since they were defending the allies and keeping the Persians at bay, they were not accountable to them for the money. The tribute the allies paid consisted only of money, not of horses, ships, and soldiers. And money he claimed belongs to its recipients and not its donors, as long as the recipients provide the services for which they are being paid. Wilderan exclaims that history through Pericles illustrated again the principle that liberal reforms are most ably executed and most permanently secured by the cautious and moderate leadership of an aristocrat enjoying popular support. Greek civilization was at its best when democracy had grown sufficiently to give it variety and vigor, and aristocracy survived sufficiently to give it an ordering taste. Perhaps this also reveals a fact about history, is that sometimes a historian will tell you as much about himself as he does the people he's describing. Plutarch describes how his leadership style changed once he gained the confidence of the ordinary people. Pericles stopped being a subordinate to the people as he had been, or is ready to yield and indulge the whims of the common people, which shifts like the wind. His success was based not merely on his ability as a speaker, but also, as Thucydides says, on the reputation his personal conduct had gained him. People trusted him because he proved himself to be totally incorruptible and beyond the reach of bribery. Plutarch continues, Pericles tuned his administration to aristocracy and kingship and used it directly and unswervingly in the best interests of everyone. 
For the most part, Pericles led the people willingly by persuading them and instructing them. But sometimes when they're especially recalcitrant, he reined them in and won them round until they saw where their advantage lay and then submitted to it. In other words, he behaved exactly like a doctor treats a complex and chronic illness by occasionally prescribing harmless pleasures and at other times bitter but healing drugs. Plutarch tells us that as a leader, Pericles enthusiastically espoused the popular cause and chose the side of the mass of the poor people rather than that of the rich, despite the fact that this was contrary to his own nature, which was very far from being sympathetic to the common people. And to an extent, Plutarch's telling us about himself here. Pericles chose to be aloof from his fellow aristocrats. Plutarch tells us that when he entered the active political life, Pericles adopted a changed way of life. The only street in the city where he could be seen walking was the one leading to the city square in the council chamber. He stopped accepting invitations to dinner and gave up on the kind of social activity so completely that he never, throughout all the many years of his involvement in politics, went to have dinner at a friend's house, as conviviality tends to undermine authority. Plus, he probably also enjoyed staying at home with Aspasia. Plutarch notes, Pericles approached his speaking with caution. Every time he walked up to the speaker's rostrum, he used to offer up a prayer to the gods that not a single inappropriate word would accidentally spill out of his mouth. Once in a funeral speech, Pericles said that although we cannot see the actual gods, we can deduce their immortality from the worship they receive and the benefits they confer. He also said that those who have died in defense of their country also have the same attributes. Plutarch's notes, Pericles was remarkable then, not only for his courtesy and self-possession, which he maintained through all the troubles and hostilities that beset him, but also for his pride, in that he considered a particularly noble aspect of his character that he never used his enormous power to indulge either envy or passion, and had never treated any enemy as irreconcilable. Plutarch tells us of a humorous story showing how Pericles was patient and unflappable. On one occasion, Pericles had insults and abuses hurled at him by some crude and outrageous fellow in the city square. He endured this abuse all day long and then went home in the evening, perfectly composed with a man following him and calling him all kinds of names. By the time he got home, it was dark, and just before going inside, he told one of his slaves to take a torch and escort the man back to his house. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Since all of our videos on the Peloponnesian War access many of the same multiple sources, we cut another video reviewing these sources. And I must say, all of these sources, Thucydides and Plutarch and Will Durant, they're all a joy to read. We will follow this initial video on Pericles and the Peloponnesian Wars, first with a video on Pericles and his qualities as a general, and the first years of the war until Pericles died of the plague, then with a video reflecting on the famed funeral oration of Pericles, comparing it to the Gettysburg Address of Lincoln and Winston Churchill's speech on the Battle of Britain. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.